name is uh, Rod or Gerard Brennan, and I am the risk and internal control officer for uh, Siemens Corporation, bless you. And uh, I'm going to be uh, teaching along with Professor Lou over here, who is uh, finishing her thesis in her PhD program here at Rutgers, uh, this course in advanced auditing and information technology. This is going to be one of the most important courses you're going to have. Yeah, let me, uh, let me show you here. Uh, well, first of all, let me do this little thing here. This is my uh, little icebreaker here, but uh, that may not work. So. But, you know, there's always risks. Everything in business is about risks, and we have different risks that we have. So you're out in a desert island by yourself, and you see your salvation come in with this little box here. But there's danger in the way to get to that box. So you've got to think about, how do I become innovative? And so I don't know why you have a saw on the island, but you find a little saw, and you saw down the tree, and you think you're on your way to solving your problem. You get over there. You pick it up, you open it up, and it's a hammock that needs two trees to, to the rest on. So, so that's, some, that's sometimes, you know, that's sometimes how life works. Okay, um, first of all, everything we do in auditing and accounting, and I, I'm assuming everyone has a basic background in auditing from the first class, right? You all had uh, Professor Brown for the first class, and, and we're going to draw on that thinking, so that's not out the window. This is just the next level of that. Okay, so, so, you know, the concepts of, uh, you know, uh, the desi effective design of a control and the effectiveness of a control and sampling and all these other things that you learned are still applicable. But um, all auditing and really accounting comes from a standpoint of, of risk, okay, and what is the risk? And we only have controls and we only have auditing done because of a risk, okay? So uh, what's the risk? What's the status of compliance? Are employees doing the right thing? How does your organization govern it itself? Can you see in this picture any risks? Is there any risks you can see in that picture? It's a little far away maybe. What do you see? Performance enhancing drugs. Yeah, that's, a, that's one that a lot of the cyclists do. How about the fact that this guy has no back wheel on his bike? That's a, that's a risk if you're going fast, right? So I don't know if you saw that. but. That's an interesting one, that whole performance-enhancing drugs in the, in the biking industry, you know, so. Okay, so why, uh, why does auditing need to change, okay? Let's talk about some of those reasons, okay? And I'm going to give you what I hope is a compelling picture of why that is. Um, well, today, most controls are monitored manually. Critical controls go untested because we only do them periodically. Control breakdowns are identified long after they occur. The average fraud goes on for about 24 months before it's found. 24 months, that's two years before they find them. And, they, and we don't find most of them. CFOs sign off on financials with imperfect information. Uh, we got excessive auditing and compliance costs. The company I work in, we spend $100 million a year on auditors. We have 450 that 450 auditors, uh, we have, uh, you know, external auditor fees of $50 million or so, you know, so, so, so we're, 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 it's a huge expense for any company, even a small company, you know, the engagements, the public accounting firms bill out at $500 an hour for, 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 for bill outs, they won't pay you that much, but that's what they're billing out at. Um, unnecessary risk and fraud, wasted time and effort, inefficient business processes, so those are some of the reasons, okay, but there's more. Uh, there's things like this, uh, all these things that have happened, and you still read about them, right? They, they haven't stopped. Enron, WorldCom, uh, you know, and, and now more recently, uh, all kinds of companies falling into trouble. So what it tells us is we're not getting there. We're not, we're not in control, if you will. That's the whole idea, okay, and, and it continues. I'm ashamed to say, but, uh, you know, the company I work for, we, we got a one, and this is public information, we got a $1.6 billion, that's a B, in billion dollar fine from the SEC and the DOJ for uh, corruption. Didn't happen here in the U.S., but it was over in, over in other countries. And in 1999, in Europe, you could take a tax deduction for corruption, for bribery. You could, you could write off your bribery costs as a tax deduction. Seriously. And, 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 and we probably spent another two billion, that's a B in billion dollars, remediating just that one fraud. And it almost put us out of business, okay? Enron, Arthur Anderson, you know, you know the stories, 
Okay. So this is really this is really costly. And 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 countries that have corruption have a 17% lower GDP than countries that don't. So corruption is a terrible thing. But that's only one kind of fraud, and it's not the most prevalent fraud. Uh, things like asset misappropriations and uh, earnings management and those kind of things are the bigger frauds. Okay? So it, we got a problem. Okay? Now let me, let me highlight this for you a little bit. Um, this is, uh, uh, you know, think about this, and you learned this in your first class. We do non-statistical sampling. Okay? So we take a sample of 30. This is we as the accounting profession, internal audit, external audit. We take a sample of 30 in a population of 25,000, and we think we're going to find things. If we took statistical samples, we'd need to triple the number of auditors we have just to do a statistical sample at a confidence level. So we're just arbitrarily taking, I mean, I think it's ridiculous. You know, we have 25,000 somethings, and we take a sample of 30, and we think we're going to find things. And not to mention, it's a periodic sample. We only do it once a year. Okay? I want to read for you. Uh, this is an audit report from the uh, PCLB for one of the big four firms. And I won't mention the name of the firm, but it's on the front of the report. And this is public information. You can get this. And this is based on 51 companies. Who knows what the PCAOB is? You guys all know what that is? Yeah. The Oversight Board, right. For the, they, they basically audit the firms, the audit firms. Listen to this report, okay? This is uh, from 2012, and they do another one every year. Most scathing audit report I ever saw. Um, it says, the firm failed to sufficiently test the issuer's assertions uh, existing for the type of services and sold as multiple element arrangements, hot topic for the SEC. Um, the firm failed to test operating effectiveness of any controls over the accuracy of manual generated shipping information. The firm failed to follow the following respects to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence to support its audit opinions on financial statements and the effectiveness of internal controls reporting. The firm failed to test the completeness of certain system-generated data and reports that it used to control. The firm failed to perform tests of details that were specifically responsible, responsible for the risk of fraud that we just talked about and identified related to the reserve for sales, discounts, and allowances. The firm failed to sufficiently test controls over the valuation of deferred assets and the accounting for disclosures of variable interest entities. The firm failed uh, selected testing that included the review of journal entries, but the firm's procedures did not include the testing of the effectiveness of the entries. The firm's tests of certain review controls over revenue, deferred revenue, accounts receivable were insufficient. This isn't just they need to improve here. This was they failed. And it goes on. The firm failed. The firm failed. The firm failed. It's the most scathing audit report I've ever seen. And I've seen a lot of audit reports. And, and so what it says is, according to the PCOB, we're not doing the job. We're using non-statistical sampling, and we're not getting the job done. Um, you know, you guys, I don't know if you have a chance someday, read this book. This is called The uh, Smartest Guys in the Room. It's about the people at Enron and what they did. And why, did they, why were they able to do it? There was the, the control environment was totally inadequate. Adequate. And yet they won an award for their compliance program a year before this all went down and all these people lost their jobs. They won an, uh, an award. Okay, and then another one is that I shared with you, and we're going to cover this in the class. In fact, I may have a speaker coming up that uh, – is a fraud investigator that uh, to share this, but um, uh, the uh, the uh, you know fraud according to statistics based on 2,000 actual cases is 42% uh, of all fraud is collusive. That means we're working together. Wayne and I are in this together. Okay, and uh, almost all financial fraud is collusive, meaning more than one person's involved. And so what are all, what's our whole control environment based on? How are controls developed? They're based on what's called a four eyes principle. So we have four eyes looking at, the con at, the, uh, at, at what's going on, two, two people looking at what's going on. Doesn't help for collusive fraud. So that means that the whole control environment, the thousands of controls that you're all going to go out and test or implement, if you go to the work for the big four, you're going to test them all the time. They're not even the controls that are going to stop most of the fraud that's going on. So, so we got non-statistical sampling. We're failing at doing the job as per the oversight board. 
and we have four eyes, we, we have the wrong control process in place. So we're not getting the job done. It's that simple, you know. And, and yet we pay a lot of money for, for these services and we do a lot of things, but we're really not getting the job done. And, and, and I don't think, like the MBA students asked, I don't think we want to admit that because that's an indictment. I'm happy to admit it because I'm convinced that we're not and that we need to do some things differently or we're going to continue to have Enrons and WorldComs and corruption and all these other things. And what the ACFE says based on – ACFE is Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. By the way, I'm a certified fraud examiner. That's one of the things I, I have. I have a certification in that. So, um, uh, but the, And the ACFE is the one real empirical group for – you know, fraud. If you want to, if you want facts about fraud instead of impressions about fraud, because fraud's elusive and most people don't know about it. But they say the only way to stop collusive fraud is to create a perception of monitoring. That's someone's watching what you're doing all the time, because that takes away in the fraud triangle the opportunity. Now I don't have the opportunity to perpetrate or conceal a fraud because someone's watching. So how does that work in practice? So at Siemens. You know, we monitor everything that everyone goes to on websites on, on, on in the company, okay? So I have no temptation to go to a porn site or run a separate business, you know, at Siemens while I'm working because I know they're watching that with technology and they're doing it on a, on a continuous basis. But, you know, if you're a, in a company and you know that they're checking 10% of the expense reports, you know, just to make sure the receipts match the expense report, what's the risk of, you know, putting another 25 bucks on that meal or, or whatever, you know, because they're, they're not going to find it. They're doing non-statistical sampling, you know. They're, you know so people, people do that math. And, and these aren't scumbags, by the way. These are people like you and me. The biggest perpetrators of fraud in any company is accountants like you and me and C-level executives. And they're your neighbors. And they have great rationale for doing these things, you know. And, and we should never put anyone in a position where they can perpetrate or conceal a fraud, no matter how good they are. I, I in one company I worked for, I was a, involved in an IT audit of an employee who stole, embezzled $350,000 from the company. The employee was an 18-year employee. The employee was doing fraud investigations for the legal department and helping with them. And that employee, and this isn't unusual, by the way, that employee, all they did was a very simple thing. They had a, a travel card, which I have, uh, and for the, for the business, an Amex card, and they were the liaison in the accounting department between the bank that issued the cards and uh, the company. And so whenever there was a kickback, a, a legitimate kickback, you know, where you get certain volumes you use in your cards, you get re refunds, or there was a return, or there was some type of account adjustment, they, the bank would call this person and say, where would you like me to put that money? And they'd say, oh, just put it against this account, which happened to be their card account. And then they went to an ATM and took out the money against their account. There's no control on that. And they embezzled $350,000. And they didn't get caught by the external auditors, because they only find 3% statistically of the fraud. They didn't get caught by the internal auditors, because they only find 14% of the few frauds that we do find. They, they got caught because somebody that they were training in their job that was going to replace them, they treated like crap because they didn't want someone to replace them when they went on vacation. And this person was upset and did some digging and saw that they had all these withdrawals for $350,000 over three or four years out of their account and never traveled. And so, uh, you know, they, they, they got caught. But it happens all the time, you know. And you're not going to find that stuff by going in and doing statistical sampling, you know. Uh, I mean, in fact, we didn't even have a control on that. So, um, so my point is simply we're not getting the job done. And that's why we need you out there to use these things we're going to show you to get the job done, okay. And, and, and I'm, I'm serious about this. I mean, you know, this, is, this is alarming. You know, it's, it's alarming to me because I know what's going on in Rutgers, in my company, in any company, and we're really not getting at it. Most people wouldn't admit that, but it's true. You know? So for these reasons, you know, we're using non-statistical sampling. Our own, our own oversight board saying we're doing a terrible job, not just a terrible job, we're really failing. Uh, the word failure in there means significant failure. That's not just, oh, it'd be nice if you did it a little more thorough. And 
our whole control system is based on doesn't address the most prevalent type of what could go wrong, and that's collusion. Okay. So, um, you know, and then you have this sort of independence issue, you know. I swear that the best of my knowledge, which is pretty poor and may be revised in future, my company's accounts are more or less accurate, and I've checked these because, you know, you know wh what's the biggest conflict of interest there is, is that, you know, we pay, uh, you know, uh, the people that are holding us accountable, we're paying millions of dollars to, to hold us accountable. I mean, you know, this is kind of the fox is watching the hen house here, you know. So. Yes, Michelle. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's a great point. And, and, you know, the motive, think about the motive for earnings management. I work and live with you guys every day. I spend more time with you than with my family. And we're in this department, this is called accounting department. And all I'm going to do is mess with these provisions a little bit because we had some bad quarters. And I just want to make sure our stock doesn't tank and you all lose your jobs. I mean, I, I care about you guys. I'm helping you out, and 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 it's going to come back in the next quarter. So that's not a big deal, you know. So I'm I'm going to do that. Or my grandmother's deathly sick, and she needs she has no insurance, and I'm just going to borrow this money from Siemens, and I'm going to give it back later, you know, when my grandmother gets better. You know? I mean, these are the kinds of rationales that very rational people, you know, go through, you know. Or I work at Siemens, and Roberts making a hundred thousand more than me over at GE and you know I'm just taking what I deserve I mean I'm, I'm working a lot more hours than Robert is I'm doing a heck of a better job than Robert is and and he's getting paid a hundred thousand dollars more than me now you know I'm just taking what I deserve from the company right just how about the corruption of power Lord Acton said power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely so put someone in a position of power yeah what's the tone in the in the company you know the guys at Enron they were they were happy and bragging about what they were doing with what they called creative accounting. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And justified desperation. You know, my grandmother's sick. I, I'm, t I'm, I'm, I'm saving my grandmother. You know? That's the opportunity point. People will only do this, and that's why I said earlier, never put any, I mean, think about it. We do it to movie stars, right? We say, you are so wonderful. You are so amazing. And we give them, we, we put them on a pedestal, if you will, and we set them up to fail because it go, you know, they, they have the opportunity to do whatever they want to do. And if you put children or people in that position, you corrupt them. You know, that's, that's, that's history repeats that many times. You know. The way? Good. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Is what? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, the reason that accountants and C-level executives perpetrate most of this stuff is because what do they know? They know what, when the auditors are coming, what they're looking at, how long they're going to be there, and when they're leaving. So, for example, in SAP, and I'm going to keep talking about some of these system things too, if I have super user access, that means I basically have unbridled access to do anything I want in the account. I can, in the, I can write an ABAP, that's the language that SAP is written in, program, that says during the accounts payable, accounts receivable transactions, I want you to take just the cents off of every transaction, the pennies off of every transaction, and send it to an e-transfer account, transfer it at 2 o'clock, turn off the security logs, transfer it at 2 o'clock in the morning to my account in, in uh, Geneva, Switzerland, and then erase everything you did and turn the security logs back on. 
and I can write a, an ABOP to do that, and you will never find it, you know, unless I have some type of continuous monitoring, and I would see it, and, and one of the analytics would be I see a break in there, of someone turned off the, the security box. But th those things happen, you know, and all you got to do is know how to do the programming to do it, and you could steal billions, because by the way, those cents add up to millions every day for even a mid-sized company. I mean, this stuff is going on, I'm telling you. <laughs> and we're not finding it, because we're not using technology to, to, to monitor. I, we're not using it enough. It is being adopted, and we'll talk about that later, some of the things. Okay, good. You guys get kind of the picture, right? And I'm not a doomsdayist, by the way. I'm an eternal optimist, but I'm, I'm just, I just want you to understand that there is a problem. We're not, we're not in this class solving a problem that doesn't exist or addressing a problem that doesn't exist, okay? Um, Here's another example is people get held personally accountable for this. I told you we got a $1.6 billion fine. That's a lot of money. You know? uh, and, uh, uh, and the estimate of what it would be, if you think about it, 5% of revenue is like uh, would it be uh, six, three and a half trillion dollars in the world GDP. This is an example that actually happened with Morgan Stanley. And this is the owner of the software company that might be here in the class that, that, that does this for. But the Justice Department, uh, there was a, a corruption issue, and the Justice Department absolved Morgan Stanley, but because it did have a continuous monitoring or an automated monitoring system, and they only went after the individual that did it and, and indicted him. Okay, this was over in China. Uh, okay. So let me, let me talk about what might look differently here between, and by the way, what I wanted to do today, if we get time, is I want to finish this to give you an idea of where we're going, and then if we have time, by popular demand, I'm going to share with you uh, the best training I ever had. I've been to all kinds of charm schools and all kinds of training, but the best training I've ever had was uh, on energy management. And I know you guys are burned out doing this program, and it's tough. And this is some great training from the Human Performance Institute in Orlando, Florida, on how to effectively manage energy in order to do school, do your job, and, and stuff. It's a, great, it's a great training thing, and it's, it, it, and it's where they take professional athletes like uh, Sampras and tennis players and others, and they train them. They take them from being number 200 on the tennis circuit or golf circuit to being number one. And they don't teach them anything about golf. They teach them how to engage intensely and then disengage for success. So I'm, I'm going to share that with you if you're interested. Would you be interested in that? We have time. No. Okay. So we'll we'll talk about that too. And and we don't. We'll finish it in another class. But so um, what's the, what are we talking about when we talk about traditional auditing? And when and when I talk about auditing, I'm not just talking about auditing here. I'm also talking about risk management, and I'm also talking about reporting. So automation is not just for auditing, but it's one place where we want to apply it. So what we have is uh, uh, traditional auditing is you, as I talked about, you observe events as part of a periodic process. You manually report the findings. You do sampling, and, and in most cases, non-statistical sampling. You capture data from each process separately, and you perform mostly manual tests and interviews. You know, that's the traditional go in and interview someone. In, 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 in what, we're, what we want to promote here is observing events closer or, or when they happen, real time. So we monitor in real time, OK? Automatic alarming when exceptions occur. And this is a very important principle that will be on the exam in this, in this class, is this idea of not just having analytics. You know what an analytic is, if you're a math major. An analytics are, you know, anything that you can put into pseudocode, you can write an analytic around today. So, for example, if I say, you know what pseudocode is? That's like, if this, then that. So, if a C-level executive, who I get from a table, makes a journal entry at month end for more than $10,000 or makes more than five of those journal entries, I want you to send me an alert. And that alert is going to be a closed loop escalated alert, meaning that if that isn't corrected or dealt with and satisfied, it's going to escalate to the next level. Really important because sometimes we go out and we do these analytics and we get thousands of records and false positives and everything, and we don't know what to do with it. And we don't have the resources to follow up on it. So this idea of closed loop alerting, this alerting is really important because you don't have time 
to monitor tens of thousands of records. And we'll show you that when we talk more about the software. So alarming is really important. Population data, we are following everything. Every website, every employee in Siemens goes to is monitored electronically to make sure it's not a porn site or, a, or, or some inappropriate site. Integrating data across multiple and distinct processes. We look and monitor end-to-end -end processes. That's one of the problems today. I go in and interview people for an audit, a traditional audit, and I say, Anna, you know, tell me about your accounts payable process. And Anna says, well, I only do, you know, this matching process. That's, that's all. I don't know what the rest of these people do, you know. And so, so now I, I can't audit because no one knows the process. Great example here at Rutgers, right? I'm trying to, I, I just teach this one little course, right? And I come in and I try and get registered. And nobody knows what, what, what the other person does with this fantastic system we have. And we're here educating the best and brightest. I told the, the presidents of Rutgers this. We're educating the best and brightest to run major businesses out in the business world, and we can't get a part-time lecturer registered over three years. So I'm like, you know, and, and it's, not that, it's not that we don't have a good system. It's probably a fantastic system. It's just that no one knows the end-to-end the -end process. They're all staring at one little piece of it, and they say, oh, you need to go talk to Jackie. No, no, Jackie says, no, you need to go talk to Caroline. No, 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 no. Caroline says, you've got to go back to Jackie. She does that, you know, and, and uh, yeah. Is what? Yeah, 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 and that's, yeah, yeah, and that's part of the problem here is people really don't want to do this stuff because then you really could simplify things. If I put autom automation in, I don't need 450 auditors traveling 80% of the time. But the thing is this, and I want to be clear about this, I'm not saying this is a panacea. This is what you apply to a lot of the routine things so that you can get into the more Enron kind of, you know, frauds and the more sophisticated time. I can spend time looking at, you know, human behavior and, and what people are doing that's maybe outside the system, okay, with money laundering and things like that. But we don't have time to do that because we're so busy, you know, ticking and tacking and getting little things. You're going to do this. You go into public accounting, you're going to be, an, or internal audit, you're going to be sitting there going, I went to, got my M MBA from Rutgers to, 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 you know, check this box against this box. And what, 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 that's not what I want to do. You know, and that's another motivation for you. You know, you want to do something interesting. You guys live on these, elect, on these electronics here. You know, you don't want to be, you don't want to be, you know, taking paper and matching this to that and reading manuals and everything, you know. Good. Good thought. Yeah, just speak up. You don't even need to raise your hand. You can just say, hey, you know, I think you're wrong. Performing repeated automated tests with low var variable costs. Okay, so that's, that's, this is the kind of stuff. This isn't complicated. This isn't, you know, this is just, you know, sort of saying, hey, why don't we use the technology that's out there? And then we get into this discussion about what's the difference between continuous uh, auditing and continuous monitoring, okay? And, and, and I, I like you to think about this, and this will be on the exam too, holistically, okay? So it doesn't matter if you're doing monitoring in order to audit. In fact, the biggest gain is, is, is using analytics to make sure your strategy and your operations are working best, not, not auditing, you know? But it, it's, auditing's a place to, to, to apply it. So the difference is that continuous auditing is an independent, uh, you know, review, meaning I got to be independent from the business I'm auditing uh, by an external or internal auditor, a qualified auditor, uh, using a variety of automated tools, okay? Continuous monitoring is, you know, an assurance function at the pleasure of management, an assurance or validation process at the pleasure of management uh, that isn't necessarily independent and may be monitoring everything. But the key is that we're going to use the same tool, use one tool. Because, uh, in fact, Dr. Vassarelli here, who, who was an innovator of this stuff back in 1989 with AT&T, they had a billing system, and they put a continuous monitoring process in on the billing system, and it was fantastic. They found all kinds of things, and they you know, spent money doing it and found all kinds of problems and corrected them and put monitoring. But the problem was that, at the time, uh, AT&T had 
you know, 100 billing systems, 100 different billing systems. So now you'd have to take the same, uh, you know, application and rewrite it for this different billing system, you know. So the idea is when you invest in this, you have one software and we do it for all types of monitoring, for business reasons, to make sure people are following processes, for assurance, for compliance, for legal, for HR, for everybody, and for audit. Okay? Now I'm leveraging the technology. And now the tools like Oracle and SAP, and we'll talk about these, we have them coming in, or SAP coming in, they have, they have, they built in these modules into here. And I'll show you some of that in a minute. Okay, um, okay why does, what does automation do? Okay. So it, 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 it improves the quality, the impact, and the assurance level, and reduces the effort of the audit. Company-wide coverage, access to, to hard facts. In fact, what we found is, you know, in the audit process we'll talk about later, you know, you have this process where you go in first and you do a risk analysis before you do an audit. Well, if I have hard data, I can skip a lot of the audit because I can say, you know, on the accounts payable, on the three-way match, I checked this data and it looks okay. Let's not audit that. But you know, there's something suspicious over here that Sally is uh, was doing. We better look at. We better check that area out in more detail because something doesn't look right there. So now I can scope down the audit. If not, they're going to hand you the audit program for you know accounts payable, 240 pages, and they're going to say, Anna, here's what you got to go do over at Siemens there. And so, and you have no data to say, I don't need to do this whole thing. So we, we use it even before we start auditing to see what we're going to audit. We did this all the time. We eliminated huge amounts of travel. We, and we got to do the more interesting parts of an audit because we could show ahead of time with data that, uh, you know, where the risk is. We're always addressing risk with auditing. We, don't, we only have controls where we have risk. We only have uh, uh, risks and opportunities that are linked to business objectives, okay? So improved audit productivity, better scoping, reduced travel, easy user interface. By the way, how many in here really would love to go on a road and just see the world? Is that something? I'm curious how many. Some of you have already seen the world, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's good to get out of your system. I mean, it's good to do it. It really is. And you know what I love about travel? I love culture. You know, the, I, the Eiffel Tower looks better in National Geographic than it does in real life, really. But I love to go to a little cafe in Shanghai and meet a guy there that's 56 years old and uh, has been an auditor his whole life, you know, or an accountant, and talk to him about what life is like living in China doing this and what is it like here, you know. That's what I love doing. I, lo I love to meet the real people. I don't even like to stay in the Berlin Marriott because you know who's in the Berlin Marriott? A bunch of Americans, yeah. You don't really meet the people, you know? So I love when I travel. I love to go to the little cafes and I was in Bangalore, India and uh, this guy was taking me to these malls and stuff that were just like the U.S. malls here. And I, no, no, I want to go where the people are. So we, we went down a commercial street in Bangalore and uh, hung out with the, you know, I saw the people up on mattresses selling saris and, and, and things, and, and, and the real people are there, and I got to know what their culture's like and how they live. That's, that's what's interesting about travel. But anyway, you don't want to travel for seven years 80% of the time. It, you have no life, and you live in airports, and they're not that much fun anymore because they search you three times before they let you on an airplane anymore. So, um, Easier user interface, uh, increased reliance. And by the way, what we wanted, Professor Lou and I and Tiffany want to demonstrate to you is these tools are not hard to use. Okay, you don't need to be an IT person. We have one IT guy here. But you don't need to be an IT person. And I'll share some stories we've done at Siemens with automation where we had no IT people involved at all. IT needs to help deliver normalized data to the process. But after that, you know, running these tools, as Professor Lou's going to show you, is not hard. This is like, you know, Excel on steroids. You know, and, and so, and that's what we want to show you, that, that using these tools is not, is not hard to do. Release, reduce client effort. I used to get hugs by the CEO or CFO of the companies saying, thank you for this audit. We didn't have to do anything because I'm not going in and saying, you know, uh, we're doing this accounts payable audit. I'd like to see the last 400 invoices that you paid. I'd like to see all your shipping uh, regs. I'd like you to get this, 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 and the other thing for me. And by the way, when you do do an audit in the big four, a little secret I'm going to tell you, 
that helps a lot when you do go and interview people and ask them for information is the first thing you do is walk in the door and say, uh, hey, before we start this audit, I'd like you to put my email on your screen here. It's rod.brennan at siemens.com. And as we talk about stuff, I'd like you to attach it right away uh, to this email and then just we can shoot it to me at the end of the meeting to make it easier for you. And the reason you do that is twofold. One, otherwise the guy says, yeah, I'll get that for you. I'll get that. Yeah, I'll get that for you. Yep, we'll do that. And then three weeks later, you're you know, under pressure to get the audit done and you have nothing and you're chasing these people down and they're gone, you know. And also, it lets you know if this guy really knows where the information is. And let's face it, most of the, almost all the information you're going to get in an audit today is electronic. So if he can't find it, he or she can't find it, that means they probably really don't know what's going on or don't know where it is. So if they, and I tell them, I say, I'll wait, you know, take your time, go find it, you know, I'll wait here in the office. And then when you're done, they press a button, you got everything you need, and you get your audit done more efficiently. So yeah. Absolutely. And, and they love it because they're not running around doing all this stuff, you know. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a few things because I was on the – I was a controller and I would get for years and I'd get aud audited, you know. We had all kinds of things to, to, to kind of throw the auditors off. One is information overload. You know, you come in and we just dump binders on your desk and files, you know, that are uh, 400 megabyte and tell you it's all in there. Go find it, you know. Or it's the delay tactic, you know. Uh, yeah, I'll get back to you on that. Or you know, uh, yeah. and, uh, I mean, it, 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 we pe they do this on purpose. And the higher up you go in an organization, the more likely they're not going to get back to you. So when you talk to the CFO, you know, they're not going to get back to you. And then, and you're going to be held accountable for getting your audit done. And you know, I've seen people that just get so frustrated because they can't get this information. Where you know. When we go in ahead of time, we're getting the information. They don't. The company does. That you're saving the business money because they don't have to go find all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Good. Any other comments? All right. We talked already at length about preventing fraud and bribery and attracting and retaining talent. You know, we have people that leave auditing because either they're traveling too much or this isn't what they signed up for. You know, I, I didn't. I didn't go to school for four years and two years in a in a graduate program to sit in a warehouse at 2.30 at night and, you know, and, and tick and tack, you know, count boxes and stuff. That's not why I went to school, you know. So let, let's do the stuff that's more interesting. It's a lot more interesting doing forensic auditing, you know, and figuring out how the mind thinks and what people might be doing. And, and, and by the way, this never ends. It's like cyber terrorism. As soon as you close one gap, you, people are thinking of where's the other place I'm going to do something wrong. You know, so it never, it's never ending. And that's why you're not going to lose your jobs because you automate. You're going to have more interesting jobs. You know. Okay. All right. Um, I like this chart. This is uh, used with permission by, uh, by uh, Approva Bizrite, which is one of these firms that we're not going to cover their software, but they use. And, and it just shows how the cycle works here. So in a typical, this is business risk and this is time. In a typical audit, uh, the uh, business risk goes up. Okay, then the auditors come in and audit, and the business risk drops down and for a while, and then it opens up again. And this happens especially with IT audit, because IT controls. Because what happens is, whenever there's a migration or an upgrade to a system, we open the system up, because we got to get the job done. There's new feature, we open up super users, give everyone access, and then we never close it down again, because it, it's working, you know? And, and, and so this is a constant, process that goes on. It's very expensive and the business risk just continues to rise over time. When we put in continuous monitoring, continuous auditing, continuous risk management, the efficiency of the process goes way down and the cost to control goes way down. So I'll share an example in a minute where Siemens, we have a hundred controls that we monitor for accounts payable because that's where bribery happens. Every single day for 869 companies on these hundred controls with closed loop escalated alerting and we do nothing. 
because this system monitors itself and anybody is an idiot to try and do anything wherever these controls are covering because you're going to get caught immediately. And within three weeks, if you don't act on it and it's not resolved, it'll be on the CFO de desk in Germany of Siemens. Very effective. Yeah. Well, yeah, and we'll talk about that too. And what's interesting is the fixed cost of implementation for this kind of technology is not very much. <laughs> it's not that high. These systems are not very expensive. You know, for example, we put in uh, an automated software in just one large division. It cost two hundred thousand dollars, dollars fully absorbed, uh, to put it in and and train and do everything on it. And the first time we ran it, we found seven hundred thousand dollars of duplicate invoices that we had not known about. That means we paid out. To, you know, so it 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 paid for itself threefold the first time we ran it. You know, so. Now, I, 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 we're going to talk about the barriers, and one of the barriers is that we have such, such disjointed systems. You know, we have SAP doing this, and Oracle doing that, and a whole made system doing that. So the normalization of the data is very difficult. Okay? So gut check, are we following all right? Good questions. Keep asking the questions, too, okay? Um, okay, so uh, PwC study recent. Continuous auditing, when they asked CEOs, CFOs, what was important, this is what they said. They said continuous auditing and monitoring, 95% of them, fraud detection, audit operational efficiency. Huge pressure. I have Ernst & Young, who's our auditor, coming to me constantly saying, Rod, help us automate more of these controls because they, they get a fixed fee. And, and think about this. Normally, the revenue model for, for big four or for accounting firms is based on what? It's based on billing out bodies at an hourly rate. So that, that discourages you from doing, using technology because the more bodies I can send into the company at a, at a good hourly rate, the more money I make. But if you can start to, so they need to change their revenue model to bill on engagement. But in the case of big companies like us, we pay a fixed fee for the whole Sarbanes-Oxley, the whole financial auditing uh, topic. And so, it, now they're coming to us saying, you know, we want to get more efficient. We want to use this technology because it's the only way that we're going to be able to be profitable in the future. They know that, you know. Not to mention they got millenniums like you guys coming in saying, you know, I want a work-life balance. I want to have a life. I want to use, I, I, I do everything I do on technology. I was raised on technology. I want to use technology to do this stuff. You know, and they say, no, no, no. And you, 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 you know, get take the, the ledger sheet and go, tick and tack, and that's not what you want to do, okay? This is another study by KPMG. Majority of companies are challenged to automate manual controls and are much less aggressive in moving to reliance on company controls. We, we're not, we're, we're, there's a, a huge barrier to this. The adoption is happening, and we right here in Rutgers, right above you here, have a symposium in November that I encourage all of you to attend, where we're going to have speakers from all over the world, practitioners, uh, regulators, uh, big four software companies, and, and you know, I want you to hear what's going on. And, and it, it's, it's amazing how slow, in my view, the adoption is. In fact, when I did my PhD thesis in this topic, I was like, I can't believe we're not doing this stuff. And again, for me, it was motivated by personal reasons, you know. But I'm like, well, what's the holdup? Let's go. And, we, and, we, and that mantra is still going. I mean, it's, we're making progress. And this university is leading here with researchers like Dr. Lou here and others, you know, they're, they're leading this. And it's frustrating, isn't it? I mean, are you happy with how fast it's moving? No? Hmm. Okay. So when we talk about this idea of continuous monitoring, auditing, what are we really talking about along a continuum? Okay. Well, you know, and that's the thing. It's a little amorphous. You know, what does it mean? When do you know that you've reached nirvana and you have continuous auditing? So it starts out with automation of financial systems. That's just the things we put in place that we, that, you know, the, the SAPs, the Oracles, the automation that we have in our closing systems. Networking, of course, is popular. Audit workflow automation. That's where we use tools like Auto Audit and Teammate that automate the audit process. So you have electronic work papers that consolidate some of that stuff. Then you move across here and you start to extract data and do data mining. Okay, everyone knows what big data is. We're going to have a, a guy talk about big data. So that's great, except remember, when you're just data mining, if you don't have closed loop alerting, escalated alerting, 
then you have more work to do because you find things, now you've got to dig deeper and deeper. And sometimes that's appropriate in continuous auditing in order to scope your audit. But you can't just mine tons of data and hire tons of people to look at data. That's not, a fi that's not a fi efficient from an auditing standpoint. So then you get, you know, exception reporting. Dashboards are real big. You know, a lot of the softwares now are trying to come up with dashboards that I can sit there as a CFO. I'll show you one we use at Siemens, and I can say, okay, there's trouble over here. This company looks good. The controls are good here. Now that's that 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 gets a lot of attention. But there's got to be substance and design behind the dashboard, or it's not really adding value. Okay. So then, you know, we get to real-time reporting. And by the way, Dr. Vassarelli says this that. Probably the biggest motivator for this is not going to be auditing because audit departments don't have money. It's going to be real-time reporting. I think you guys had a case that was done in the Harvard Business Review on Cisco Systems on how they went to uh, virtual reporting. Did you do that case in one of your other classes? It was uh, Cisco Systems. They went from a 14-day close to in your IT class. Okay, yeah, yeah. You went from a 14-day close to zero, and they did it by using analytics and automation. And they had some problems because they got sued later because they made bad decisions, but, but that's the idea. Because I'll tell you this, if the investment community knew that we could do real-time closes, they would have huge pressure on companies to do it. And the reason you don't have real-time uh, reporting is because mostly of the time it takes to provide assurance and audit, right? It takes so much time because we're doing it manually. So just think about how that would change the dynamics if we could close the books on the first day of the month in every company and do, you know, 20 Fs and 10 Ks and 10 Qs the day after the, the close. You know? I mean, what would that do? They say it cost a million dollars a day in a, in a Fortune 5 company to delay a close to, for every day that it takes you to close. You save a million dollars a day. So, you know, it, it would be well worth it. Okay, so a little bit about some of the things we've done. Uh, you know, we, and again, the, the tipping point, the trigger for the company I work for, for us getting into this, was the fact that we got, we got in trouble. We had, a one, we had a corruption issue, okay? And what happened was that the regulators, Deloitte and Touche, or well, Deloitte was the investigators, uh, and uh, Devin Voice, the law firm, they, one of the questions they ask is, what are you guys doing with technology? They asked the question. So we said, oh, gee, well, let's, we raised our hand, said IT was in the room somewhere. They said, IT, go develop an, au an automated auditing system, you know, because it sounds like IT. But by the way, that's a mistake because IT is not the ones to develop this because they don't understand controls and the control environment. They're the ones to provide the governance for the technology, but they're not the ones to implement this. Okay, so what we did is uh, it was in the business. You know, we had a lot of audits with segregation of duties. Everyone knows what segregation of duties is. That's uh, making sure that the person paying the bills isn't the person, uh, you know, uh, authorizing the bills, that kind of thing. And there's so many permutations and combinations that you can't do it manually. So that, that's where a lot of these softwares were birthed from was segregation of duties technology, you know, ACL and some of the others. So what we did is we developed some systems coming out of this where we're monitoring, as I said, 869 consolidated companies every day in real time on population data with a dashboard. I'll show you that in a minute. We did uh, segregation of duties in six of our sectors, purchase to pay in two large companies, travel and entertainment expense. Travel and entertainment expense is high, uh, is, is, uh, high likelihood, low impact frauds or problems, okay? Meaning it's not huge if you add $25 to every you know, meal you have or, or pad your expense report. It's not a huge impact, although if everyone does it, and someone, me who mentioned culture earlier? Culture, yeah, culture, okay? So you have a culture where I'm an executive and I have 45 people reporting to me, and every time I go out to dinner with my colleagues and customers, I buy a $200 bottle of wine or four $200 bottles of wine. Well, what do you think the people that work for me are going to do? They're going to go order $200 bottles of wine and abuse the, you know, the system. Or I'm going to stay at the you know, Marriott luxury suite instead of the regular room because, and so everyone who works for me is going to do the same thing. So it, it becomes the tone. It becomes the culture, you know. And I'm going to look the other way when people do, you know, you know, I mean, 
he's a great salesman, so I'm not going to worry if he, you know, uh, goes to all the Yankee games and rents a booth and spends a lot of money because he's a great salesman, but I'm violating the policy of the company, okay? So then that creates a culture that says this is okay. And then when you get, you know, 300,000 people that are abusing it, now, now it could be significant. But T&E is, is usually not a big one. Earnings management, the average, uh, the average impact is a million dollars or more of earnings management abuses. It's much smaller. Order to cash, we have GL and finance, okay? And what we've done here very effectively, and I've been a part of a lot of this, is, is uh, you know, I actually took some of my auditors when I was in the audit side out of the auditing group in order to work on some of these projects because I wanted them to learn it so we would learn how to do this stuff in audit. Because it was the business, it wasn't the audit group, because the audit group didn't have the money. The business had issues that were outlined by public accounting or by uh, you know, uh, problems in the business by internal auditors or external auditors, and they had to address these things. The audit department, we did, we set up a data analysis forensic technology center. That's the people that come in and take your hard drive and crack it and, and do big data analysis and some of that. That's forensic technology group. We have that. And we took audit action sheets from an automated audit, IT audit, that we used to do manually, and we automated that for every company. I mean, it's amazing. We used to sit there, and even though it was automated, we'd go slash N, SA38, and check this on this system in SAP. But we have almost 300 SAP systems, over 200 SAP systems. So it takes forever to do that, where I can write one analytic, run it across every SAP system, and monitor that system, okay? So, so that, this is, uh, you know, just an example of what we do. Also, in SAP, is a thing, a tool called AIS, Audit Information System, that is an automated, I, I want you guys to learn SAP, because 60% of the Fortune 5 companies in the US and around the world, you go in the airport, they say, you know, Adidas uses SAP, Porsche uses SAP, use SAP. And it's, a, it's, it's it, and they use it for everything, for accounting, controlling, uh, logistics, uh, HR management, uh, investment management, financial services, you know, it, it has company, uh, company level modules, industry, industry standards. And Siemens, we're SAP's largest customer. We have over 150,000 users, because, you know, German company, German company. And uh, it's an amazing tool. I mean, you can do anything with SAP. And it's really not that hard to use, and there are no experts in it, okay? Because everyone learns one part, you know, I am HR, payroll, salary payroll, and I'm crack at that. The best people in the world at it are people from India and Germany, you know, the consultants. They make, they bill, they used to bill out at $350 an hour if you want to really make money. But, uh, you know, but great thing to learn. Got me a huge boost in salary because I knew SAP. I came to Siemens as an SAP consultant. And all, and I only worked on the financial side, the FI side. I didn't know anything about some of the other things. But, but anyway, within SAP, they have a module called AIS that was developed by the big four firms and SAP. And interestingly, it started getting so good for doing auditing that SAP, the big four, abandoned it. And SAP did too because of liability. The big four, and a guy from SAP that developed it told me this. He said they, they, they abandoned it, SAP abandoned it because they had liability. Because they were taunting it as what they, you could use to be compliant with Sarbanes-Oxley. Everyone knows what Sarbanes-Oxley is, right? By the way, if I say anything, acronyms, I'm um, acronym, you know, if I say any acronym that's local to Siemens or, and you don't know what it is, PCAOB, XBRL, uh, you know, I want you to raise your hand and say, wait, 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 wait explain that, okay? Because I'm assuming you know all this stuff, and it's not embarrassing if you don't, because you just might not have had it in the class yet. So don't hesitate to ask, okay? But, uh, so, uh, uh, AIS was concerned that if they said our software helps you be compliant with Sarbanes-Oxley, that there would be liability, that you'd come back later and say, we're suing SAP because we failed Sarbanes-Oxley and we were using your software. And the big four, they abandoned it because they thought it was going to take away their jobs. You know, because if, if I, this thing has in it, it has business audit processes for financial statements, balance sheets. Uh, segment reporting, consistency checks, profitability, sales orders, and it does basically an automated audit. It, and you can put this in your work stream and run this on a continuous basis too. So, 
Um, I know some of the folks had to leave to go to that thing there, and I want to make sure. So we're going to, we need to finish here at 1230. Is that right, Michelle? 1230, okay. So 1215, okay, so we'll, we'll do that. So Okay, so this is a tool that is delivered with most SAP systems, and most people don't know what's even in there, including audit departments. So they're still going and auditing around the system, outside the box, okay? Problem. All right, someone asked before, what about the investment here, okay? This is actually just a sample of an investment for a large firm, okay? I changed the numbers a little bit, but it's, it's about right. And what we did was here we looked at only out-of-pocket savings, okay? Things like reduced compliance cost for the audit department, reduced compliance cost for the business, Okay? That means because I'm using technology, I don't, as an auditor, I don't have to fly all these people around. I don't need as many people maybe, or I don't, I, my cost, I mean, what's the cost of, a, of in, in an audit organization? It's mostly people costs, right, and travel. That's the cost of an audit department. It's usually not chairs and tables and buildings, you know. Uh, and then reduction of external audit fees because if I improve the efficiency for the audit department, uh, then the external auditors are not going to have to do as much work. So in any company, you have you know three basic lines of defense. You've got the business and the co internal control environment. You got the internal auditors and you got the external auditors. And the goal of all of them is to improve and assure a good assurance system to address risk in the business against business objectives. If that's really good and has a lot of automation in it, then the internal audit people have less work to do. And the external audit people have less work to do. So when we looked at just this, okay, just these three out-of-pocket costs, and we look at the cost of putting in a system, and this was for a worldwide international company system, about $7 million for the whole system, the whole installation, and, and internal resources, we got a net present value uh, with a payback within one year. And then over... Uh, you know, tw 20, almost $30 million savings over three years, okay? But what we didn't include in here was, remember I said earlier that fraud is 5% of revenue, okay, in the average company, based on 2,000 actual fraud cases by the ACFE, Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. Now, if I say, if I take any part of that as impact on, on, that we're going to save. It, because, by the way, if you save $1 in fraud, where does it go? It goes right to the bottom line. And the injustice of it is that who gets credit for that? Not the audit department, because it, it flows through to the business, right to the bottom line. You need to, you need to generate $1.30 or more in sales in order to get a dollar. You save a dollar in fraud, it goes right to your bottom line. Okay? But uh, so if you don't believe that it's 5%, and by the way, the fraud I just mentioned to you in Siemens with the remediation, the fine and the remediation cost was almost 5% of our revenue for one year, okay? So, and that's only one fraud, and that's only one category of fraud. But let's say you don't believe it's 5%, then cut it in half, okay? And cut it in half again, and then cut it in half again and again. And what we did for this, uh, this uh, uh, P&L here is we said, let's just take one half of 1%. Let's say by creating this perception of monitoring, all we do is stop one half of 1% of the fraud. Look what it does to the, the financials. It goes from $29 million savings over three years to $866 million savings in a large international company. Now think about that. You know, I mean, just one half of 1%, I think that's hugely conservative. And Dr. Vassarelli makes the point that if fraud is 5% of revenue, mistakes and inefficiencies are probably another 5%, which this also addresses. Because I can use monitoring to make sure that you're following processes, that people are following processes. And that's, that's, really, that, that's even more valuable than the control thing. Because what happens in companies, in big companies, people follow the informal process. We do, we, you know, the path of least resistance drives rivers and men crooked, you know. Because, you know, we, we take the easier way and, and, and we use the informal system we're, and th therefore we're not compliant or we're not efficient sometimes, okay? Now, let's use an actual case study here. This is uh, Wells Fargo. They have uh, 3,000 branches, right? And so they embarked on an automation process just to address some controls in their branches, never mind the whole system, okay? 
So what they did was they used to, under the traditional method, they used to uh, go out and audit 600 of those branches each year. That's a sample okay, of 3,000. And under the new system, with the automated monitoring, they cover all 3,000 branches, all, all 150 controls or whatever in 3,000 branches, okay? 500% increase in coverage, all right? Then uh, they, uh, they uh, hours spent by auditing, okay? They used to go out to cover 600 branches and spent 2,600 hours with 15 employees in order to just cover one little section of the branches. Now, with the automation, they cover uh, 20, they, they only spend 2,500 hours because it's all automated. All they got to do is look at the exception reports where they have exceptions and, 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 and cover them. So that's a 90% decrease in audit hours. They reports, they used to write, every audit you do, you go out and you write an audit report. That's 600 audit reports. Now they write uh, a total of eight audit reports. They do a couple of summary reports, but they audit the whole thing and they write one report on the whole thing. Another huge savings that is, you know, that the automation provides. And then they had 15 people doing 600 of these locations. Now they have two people that do a more thorough job on a population basis of 3,000, okay? And think of, is there anything more commoditized or easier to automate than branches of banks, right? What, they're all supposed to be following the same process. It's the same bank, it's the same regulator, it's the same, you know, uh, Basel II requirements and financial uh, accounting requirements, okay? So, you know, it's a perfect place to put this in. Now, the other 13 people can go out and look at the main branch and find out where people are doing more sophisticated frauds. Does that make sense? Okay. Gut check, are we okay? You following me here? Okay. What are we doing on time? So, let Okay, I need to give you a break. So, um, quick question here. This would be a clicker question. I'd like you to just raise your hand or, uh, uh, you know. Uh, so, what what is not a benefit of continuous auditing and that's or continuous monitoring or risk management (CACM)? Is it, it which is not a benefit? Is it uh, um, population data review is not a benefit? Lower level of audit precision real-time or near real-time feedback, auto-alerting. Which one of these is not a benefit? Yeah, the second one, right. Because we'll talk about that later, the precision of, of uh, the, the preci audit precision is the level of control precision of, a, of an analytic or of a, of a control. And that's how well is it addressing the risk and the assertions in the control. All right, so let's just take a look at, uh, I mentioned earlier, we have a program where we look at these 100 controls that include SOD, computer controls, banking controls, money laundering controls, just a whole bunch of controls. And these are monitored every day for every company that Siemens fully consolidates, okay? And they're, 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 you don't have to do anything once it, it costs money to do this, but once it was set up, it's monitoring all of these things. So, uh, you know, if anybody uh, performs a service access acceptance without a process outgoing payment, it's going gonna, it's gonna to nail that. So you're an idiot. And, and you know what's interesting is we've changed the behavior. People don't abuse this anymore because <laughs> they're being monitored. Now, are they doing other things? I'm sure they are. But in this area, this is, we, we get very few exceptions here at all. And usually if we do, it's because it's a new employee that missed something or made a mistake. It's not a, a blatant fraud, okay? And so what the CFO of the company can do is each one of these dots represent one company of those 800 or almost 1,000 companies. And we have a formula that was developed by PwC as a consulting that's a risk formula. It's actually more complicated than it needs to be. And what it does is it says, that any company that has these three or four things in combination going on, we want to take a look at more closely. And so the CFO, of the, and if I was the CFO of one company, I'd just have one dot here, and it's either in the green area or it's outside the green area. So this would be a dashboard example, okay? And there's more, you know, tech, high-tech dashboards that you can see, okay? And uh, so then I click on that, on that, and I get, you know, this particular company, and it's going to tell me where I have problems. So I have, 
POs created on or before, on or after the date of the invoice receipt. That's a problem, okay? So I see that I've got an occurrence of that in, in uh, 188 in review, and I just made these numbers up, but, and now these are gonna be monitored, and they're gonna be monitored every day, so that if someone doesn't clear that up and give a valid explanation as to why it happened or correct it or investigate a fraud around it, it's gonna stay on there, and within three or four weeks, it's gonna be on the desk of the CFO of the company. So it has, what that's this point that you wanna remember for the test is uh, closed loop escalated alerting. That's this idea that we're not just monitoring things, but we're changing behavior because we're gonna act on things, okay? So if I you know, bring up a porn site on the computer here, someone's gonna know that immediately and Rod's gonna get reprimanded or fired or whatever for looking at a porn site, okay? So, so you know, same here. If anybody has a PO that's created on or after the invoice date, they're gonna have to go in and explain that and if they can't explain it, they're gonna take the consequences for what they did or whatever could lead to discharge from the company even, and, and that's gonna happen, and this does not come off of here until that's solved. That's really important, because otherwise, you as an auditor now, instead of hoping you're gonna find something with your non-statistical sampling, you're looking at 10,000 problems and not knowing what to do with it, you know, and trying to investigate 10,000 problems. And we had that happen, we had where, a, a, you know, a, an auditor put in a T and E system, and we found so many things wrong that the auditor just threw their hands up and said, I'm just gonna go get on an airplane again and fly around and do sampling because this is too, there's too many things here. I can't deal with it, you know. I mean, that's how much you, that's how much you find. That's, that's what's so amazing about this. You find the most unbelievable thing. In fact, we're gonna have you guys work on some actual company data in T&E later in the class. And I wanna see what you guys can find, you know, where there's problems. And we're gonna use this oversight tool to do that, okay? So it's, it's, it's interesting what you find, you know. And, and you know, it, it, it's shocking what you find, honestly, all right? And then uh, we also, because of this, we know what each system is and how much activity is in the system. So there's a lot of other benefits. We can do risk ratings. We can, you know, monitor our systems that we're using and how efficiently they're working and how many transactions are being made. So I can go in and I know that, you know, the companies we ought to look at and maybe monitor or look at more closely for other types of fraud or these companies because they have more activity than other companies, okay? Here's another system that we use. This is a product that we purchased from a company called First Stripe, and this is for payables, okay? And we run this out of our shared service center, and what this, this does is it takes vendor payments, invoices, and employee data. It takes things, third-party things, like prohibitive listings, private mailing listings, prison addresses, FBI most wanted, those kind of things. It takes scam vendors, high-risk addressees, proprietary algorithms. These are things that are gained from consulting firms and stuff. And then we take every invoice that we pay, every one, and we run it through this first strike tool that looks for, forensically, looks for fraud of some kind, okay? And what it does is it runs all of these tests, and these are things that create risk, like initials in a vendor name, high-risk zip codes, uh, employee vendor matches. So the employee address is also a vendor address. That's a risk, okay? Uh, scam vendors, no POs. Who, who knows what Bedford's Law is? Do you guys know what Bedford's Law is? That's a, an interesting research guy named Bedford that did this research that showed that in any random group of numbers like PO numbers or accounts receivable numbers, that lower digit numbers in the first or second position occur much more frequently than higher numbers, such as eights at single digits, eights and nines. So ones and twos and threes occur much more frequently. So if I go in and look at a data set, I have per, they have statistics of how often they, they, they appear that way. If I go look at a data set and I see a substantial number of, of, uh, of the numbers that begin with eights and nines and sevens, then I know that someone's manipulated that data probably and there's potential fraud. So that's what Bedford looks at. It's, it's used a lot in forensics and statistics and stuff. So, okay. My math major, where'd she go? Okay, she may know, she might have known that. So, um, all right, and then what we do, and this is interesting, so then we put a weight on any of these things. So if we have a cell phone number, then you can find that out the vendor only has a cell phone number, that just raises a flag. It doesn't mean something's wrong. But if we have a, 
prohibited vendor, a vendor we shouldn't be doing business with, that's 100 points. A cell phone is 50 points. Um, a high risk or a initials in the vendor name is 20. And an employee name that matches a vendor name is 150. And then what we do is we say, okay, our risk tolerance is 150. If we see any transactions that have a score of 150, we want to pull them out for closed loop escalated alerting, okay? And then it pulls those out, and that, that's a potential risk vendor. Then they actually use Google Map, and if they see a vendor address that matches a, a, an employee address, okay? And you wouldn't believe what we've seen here. We've seen you know, vendor employee addresses that are prison addresses in Toronto, Canada, and match a vendor address. And then you go and look at the uh, single accounts payable clerk who lives in this mansion in, uh, you know, Boca Raton, Florida somewhere, and, you know, y and you start to wonder what's going on here. So, so they, they use visual things, too, to look at, look at where, the, where, the ven where the person is. So, so this is really effective. And, and, you know, here again, at first, we found all kinds of things, and we investigated them. Some people lost their jobs. You know what we find today? Nothing. And there's even managers that say, well, you know, wh why, uh, why, uh, why do you keep using this tool? Let's shut it off. It's not doing anything. No, no, no. It is doing something. It's stopping. It's changed behavior, as evidenced by, on a population basis, we're not finding anything anymore. So you're an idiot if you're going to go in and violate one of those rules. You're crazy, because you're going to get caught immediately with technology, where if we were just doing sampling, you could do that for years and you probably wouldn't get caught. You know? And if you did, you can run. But uh, so, so no. Now, now, do we have everything covered? No. There's other scams that people can do. But you start to put in this technology, very low cost once your initial investment's finished. Okay? So where am I at here? OK. Then, uh, and also, you know, it's interesting today, and one of the research students here did a lot of work on this using uh, um, uh, apps. You know, a lot of the technology is now on your, uh, you know, on your cell phone here. You can, you can download apps for uh, doing audits of all kinds, safety audits, financial audits, and eventually we get to the point where we just put those apps together. So you can suggest this when you go to work in, a, in the firms. You know, why don't, we just audit, why don't we just use application audits and not spend money on huge, expensive software? And, and the apps are a lot, some of them are free. So here's a construction hazard au audit, a fleet vehicle inspection audit. You can pull these right off the internet, access your data, run them through your data, and, and do an audit from your cell phone. That'll get people's attention, huh? Instead of, uh, you know, trying to invent it yourself. Okay. So. What we want to envision here and what we want to move towards is where we have uh, one tool, okay, with normalized data. And we're going to talk a lot about how you get to normalized data, you know, because you've got to make sure if you have multiple systems and you have a data warehouse uh, it, you, and you can get the data in there, now you can audit everything from one place. Also, SAP has a new tool, and we're going to have SAP in here, the second or third to last class, and they're going to tell you about a tool called uh, HANA, which is SAP's in-memory analytics. And what it's basically doing is it's taking your hard drive and everything on your hard drive and keeping it in RAM memory and then running real-time analytics against the RAM memory. So everything's in RAM, so everything's instant. There's no, uh, you know, getting data. It's revolutionizing the, uh, not just the audit, but the reporting field too because it's and, and and what it does is it uses optimization technology so that we don't have to store things on disks and files and you store all every all your data in real time memory and you can do everything instantly and, and it's it's been a big hit for SAP but so now i have i have business managers financial managers auditors internal and external internal control people uh, you know all using the same system and we do that today we give E and Y access to our data to run analytics so they can improve their efficiency of their audits. Okay? So again, this isn't rocket science. This, is, this stuff is not hard. It's, it it kind of makes sense, you know? I mean, why not? Where, you know, what we don't want to do is we don't want the mid business managers to go develop a system, the financial managers to develop a system, external auditors' systems, internal auditors' a system, you know? And by the way, when you get into the firms, by the way, how many are going to the firms? Anybody, anybody already 
work going to work with the firms soon? Okay. Okay. And again, I encourage that. I, I, I told the story about my daughter, but my brother is a partner with Ernst & Young. Anyone going to Ernst & Young? No? no? Okay, you are. Okay. Look for uh, Tim Brennan. He's a partner there. Uh, he's actually on the, anyone going on the tax side? He's on tax. Nice. Okay. Yeah. But good, 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 great firms. You know, great, great experience too. But you guys got to help change it, okay? So, um, yeah. Okay. So um, just want to talk for a minute. This is a little review of your uh, of your audit. I want to give you guys a break here too. My gosh, huh? Maybe what we'll do is uh, let me go through this quickly. We'll take a little break and then we'll do the energy management. Does that sound good? No. You guys look like you could use some energy, huh? What I love is I come in this class and no one has a tan. You know, <laughs> you guys, you guys don't get out in the sun, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, um, in auditing, uh, when we did this study, when we were doing this automation at Siemens, you have, you know, five basic uh, steps in an audit. You plan, you do field work, you do reporting, you do wrap up, and you do follow up. Okay, and. Uh, of those, and these are functions down below that. And this is based on a little study we did at Siemens of what percent of the audit is each one. So 20% is, is planning, 54% is the field work, 11% is reporting, wrap up, and follow up. Then we marked in blue here the things that automation can help with. It can't help with everything. You know, automation isn't going to write your audit report for you, okay? Although it'll allow you to do one audit report instead of, you know, 50. Um, but individual risk assessment. This planning part, really important because it's going to allow you to, you know, to, to do a good part of this using automation because I can do, use data to scope down my audit. So if I have this, you know, 400 page audit and I don't want to be, have my auditors have to do 400 pages, I can use analytics to, to say we only need to do a third of this audit because we see the risk now. We can, we can, and we can quantify it with data. Okay. And then, of course, the analysis, reconciliation, quality review. The reporting, not much help from automation. I mean, you can take the report from the last audit and copy it in Word, but that's not really automation. Uh, wrap up, that's all meeting with the staff. And by the way, I'm not discouraging. You still want to go out and meet the people you're auditing. You want to read the tone in the middle and the tone at the top. But you don't, you don't, you don't got to hang out there. You don't got to be there all the time to audit. And then ongoing monitoring. So what we found was when we did this study, we found that about 60% of the typical audit process can be automated, you know, without, without changing anything, just by putting in technology. And the most important part is probably this whole planning thing, okay? So, you know, when, so the impact that you have, you know, 70 travel, personnel and travel is 76% of the average budget. So for example, I have a large international company with 400 auditors, and the, the sunk cost of, fully absorbed cost of an auditor is probably about $200,000 a year. And you're saying, wow, I'm not, they're not paying me that much when I'm starting, okay? But if you take travel, burden at 30%, a salary, over, any other overhead, it's about $200,000. And if you don't believe that, I've signed uh, travel report expenses for people that did worldwide travel that's that you know made I don't know 150 thousand dollars and had a, a 230 thousand in travel costs because they were flying all over the freaking world to do audits you know you know in one year 230 thousand dollars just for hotel meals and entertainment you know that kind of thing so that's that's the big impact so what we did was we took scenarios and we said okay a traditional audit I'm going to make an announcement conduct the audit risk assessment using old audit reports, requested data, interviews, and phone review. Scope the audit based on risk, often limited by older unavailable data. Prepare an audit planning memo, a kickoff meeting, prepare the audit scoping memo, et cetera, okay? In a continuous thing, I'm gonna take an audit team, use real-time control monitoring dashboards containing hard facts covering the specific entities and the audit programs and scope as the basis. The audit team creates individual queries and rule sets to perform specific analysis and transactions, get direct access to the system, drill down the entity and the IT systems to validate risk. So I'm going to go in ahead of time, and I'm going to see where the risk is, and I'm going to say, okay, and I'm going to document this is why we're doing the, only these parts of this audit. Now I've reduced the scope without impacting the risk. Remember, audit is always based on risk. And AS5 you know, said that we should do risk-based audits. So I'm only going to audit 
and run analytics on the things that, because of having data, I'm going to scope down the audit significantly. Okay? Another example, and this is an actual case where we had, we had a, an infosec flaw in our Oracle database that basically we had all these controls in SAP uh, that locked the front door, but the back door was wide open because at the database level there was, uh, there was an infosec problem. Okay? And so we did some analysis to find out that that was affecting 160 or something of our, of our you know, 800 companies. So under the old practice, we would have gone out and said, okay, let's go out to these 160 companies and find out what's going on and do an audit and fly all these people out there. We said, no, that's ridiculous. We know what the problem is because we use technology to find it. And we're not going to do, we're going to do some planning, skip the field work, skip the reporting, skip the wrap up, and let's just do the follow up. So we basically did the planning. We sent out a note to all of these, an alert, closed loop alert, saying get this fixed now to 160 companies. Had them fix it, wrote one, one uh, report, didn't even write a report, just made sure it was fixed, closed it up, and the whole thing's done. So what we did was we eliminated 70% of the audit cycle, okay, just by using automation. So you gotta think differently. Otherwise, under the traditional model, we would've went out to 160 companies to investigate this problem and dealt with it, okay? Waste of time. Um, this is where we, uh, so that's the, you know, we, we, that's just summarizing that, we eliminated them. Okay, then we have, uh, uh, th this was these automated sheets, I'll skip through this a little bit. So, so let's talk for a minute about barriers to change. What do you think are some of the barriers to change in audit? First, uh, it's too intrusive, too expensive, you mentioned that, the skills, uh, risk of independence is an issue. The big four sometimes say, oh, we can't help you guys with that because uh, you're, uh, you know, we're, we're going to violate our independence, which, by the way, is not true because they, they violate their independence if they give us the controls. But if all they do is help us develop a system to monitor the controls, that's not a violation of, of, of public accounting independence. Other ones are inadequate restrictions, access, modification of software, you know, we sometimes put intelligent agents on to extract the data. Well, what if someone can compromise that agent? Or if the tool, the audit tool that you use, the automated audit tool, it has to be accredited, meaning it has to be safe. Because if I can go in and, 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 and mess around with the monitoring tool, that's a problem too. You know? so, okay? And then in your book, I want you, when you do your reading, because most of you don't have the book, I, I was going to go into more detail on this, but there's some, there's some more... In on page 20, there's some good things about logic or tests must be hard-coded, automated tools and techniques can only be used by IS auditors. You know, it's this perception that it's hard to use. And what we, Professor Lou and I want to show you is this technology is not hard to use. It's simple to use. Um, uh, Hands-on approach, client systems data will be compromised by the use of the software, or the software may screw up my SAP system, basically, is what it's saying. So there's a good chapter on here, I'd like you to read that. I like some of the acronyms that they use in the book here, like T, Technology Enabled Audits, you know, or Automated Tools. So I do want you to read your chapters here per the syllabus, because that'll, that'll make sure you have the background for it, okay? So yeah, those are some of the reasons. Here's some of the other reasons that the freaking, you know, world is complicated, and we got so many informal systems, and, you know, and you'll see this when you get in these companies, you know, you walk in the foyer and everything looks great and organized and then you start digging into the processes and you find out that this department doesn't talk to this department and people don't know the end-to-end -end processes, you know. And then, you know, another resistance to change is some of this kind of stuff that, uh, you know, uh, the phonograph is of no commercial use. Thomas Edison said that in uh, 1880. Everything that can be invented has been invented. Charles Duell, director of U.S. Patent Office. Who the hell wants to hear actors talk? Harvey Warner, 1927. I think there'll be a world market for about five computers. Thomas Watson, IBM, 1943. There's no reason for any individual to have a computer in their home. Ken Olson, president of digital. I love this one. Uh, 1981, I was an accountant in Southgate, California in this year, working with PCs and apples, trying to get used technology just to do closing the books. And Bill Gates said 640K ought to be enough for anyone, Bill Gates. So but today, I want to just share with you real quick, I'm going to give you a, a bridge version. 
This is from the Human Performance Institute in Orlando, Florida, shared with permission. Best training I ever had, and I went to all kinds of charm schools and both technical things and, and, and soft skills, but this was really good. And this is, again, where they take professional athletes, and now they do it with corporate athletes, mostly C-level executives from companies, and they take them through this course. It was $4,500 for two and a half days, and we worked out in a gym every day and we ate organic food down there, and we learned this stuff. And it's, it's, it, it covers, so, you know, again, disagree with this stuff too if you want, but it's, it's, it's really interesting. And it's something I'm, uh, full disclosure, I'm not here yet. I'm, I struggle with some parts of this, some parts of it I've done well, but it's really helped me in my career uh, and personally as well. So um, I won't do this, so I'll skip this. So this is the typical student in the PA MBA program here at Rutgers where we have an energy, a human energy crisis. We don't really have a time management crisis or a stress crisis because time management, we all have the same amount of time and stress is a natural part of life and you can't eliminate stress. You can manage stress, but you can't eliminate it, okay? But energy you can manage, okay? And so just some statistic, disengaged workforces decrease operating income by 33%. This is based on Towers Watson research, okay? Um, employees, uh, disengaged employees cost businesses $300 billion a year. Absenteeism, low productivity, staff turnover, accidents, etc. And employees believe that corporate engagement is the key to improving that. 54% of corporate executives are disengaged, meaning they're not, their head's not really in the game. They're going through the motions. And there's no worse thing in the world than not to love what you do. If you don't love what you do, don't do it. 65% of employees are disengaged and don't give their best effort. And 21% of employees are toxic, even trying to sabotage. You know? And I've seen some of this. You know? I, I don't doubt this at all. 62% reported that burnout, emotional and physical exhaustion affected them or their organization more in the past five years. 78% are concerned about people's capacity to manage the work demands. Full engagement is the acquired ability to invest your full and best energy right here and now and then to disengage, okay? Life is not a marathon. Life is a series of sprints and, 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 and re-engaging. So I used to look at life as a marathon and try and run this marathon. I'd, I'd play tennis with you and I would try and be on for two and a half hours and beat you in tennis. And you know what? I wouldn't beat you because I'm not recovering. You got to recover on a regular basis in everything you do. So quick, quick test. I want you to just grab a pencil and write down one to four here, true or false. Address these questions. 30 seconds. Go ahead. Let's see how smart you guys are. Just put true, false, true, false, whatever. No, no, you don't have to hand it in. It, it, this is the final exam. <laughs> All right, you got it? All right, so how many think the first one's true? Okay, second, true. Third, okay, fourth, they all true? How many think they're all true? How many think they're all false? How many don't care? No, okay, well, the truth is that uh, they're all false, all right, and I'll show you why, okay? Skillful investing time in things and people you care about spawns harmony and fulfillment. Well, that's partially true, okay? But the truth is that managing energy, not just time, is the key to extraordinary results. And our most critical resource is our energy, and most fail to manage it effectively. So, again, you, can't, you can manage time, but you, we all have the same amount of time, okay? So I want you to think about this. I don't know the ages of you, and I certainly won't ask the women their ages, but um, I, I'm going to tell you this, that... Your, your capacity, this red line of energy naturally, peaks at about 30 years old. Actually, it's about 27 for guys and 24, 25 for women, because women mature faster than men, and so their energy starts to decline before men, too. But, um, but the demands on your life, you know, you're here in the MBA program. I don't know how many are married or single, but... You know, you're going to get maybe married someday, you're going to have kids, you're going to have college expenses, you're going to get a career, you're going to become a manager of, of, of multiple numbers of people, maybe CEO of the organization, CFO of your organization. So the demands on your, on your energy are going to go way up, but your capacity for energy is going to go down, and that gap is what we call stress. That's what creates stress. 
okay? And you can't eliminate, you don't want to eliminate stress. Stress actually makes you grow, okay? So, so it's, it's managing energy that's the most important thing. The human spirit is fueled from a different energy source than a physical body. False. So the energy that I need to stand up here and teach this course right now is the same energy I need to run a marathon or to have an uh, intimate discussion with my wife or to answer, to perform on a tough test that you have. It's the same energy. It's energy. And, and, if, and, and if you don't have it, you're not going to respond right to your spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend probably under stress. You're not going to do well on the test. You're not going to be able to run the marathon in the time that you wanted to do it. And uh, so energy affects all parts of you, your mental, spiritual, uh, emotional, uh, and physical capabilities. It rec and, and the only way to build energy is to push yourself to the level of discomfort beyond where you're normally operating. So as an example, if I want to build up this bicep, okay, if I, if I get a weight and I lift, I break down that bicep, right, and then it builds back stronger. If I want to protect this arm from any trauma and I put a cast on it and keep it perfectly safe and still and rested, what happens to my arm? It atrophies, right? That's exactly what happens to you if you try and avoid all stress. You got to value having some stress in your life, and you got to make some stress in in all areas so that you improve. Otherwise, you don't improve energy. If you don't push yourself a little bit beyond, not no pain, no gain. That's not good because pain isn't good, but discomfort is. Okay. So, for example, uh, when I work out, and I work out just 20 minutes, three or four times a week, I do interval training. So I don't just get on an exercise bike and and pedal for 45 minutes and read a magazine and drink a cup of coffee. All that does is burn calories. It doesn't increase your energy level. I get up on my stand-up paddle board I do out in the ocean, and I go one minute. I go three minutes to warm up. Then I go one minute as hard as I can go for one minute, all out. And you can do anything for one minute. It hurts. You know, I hate it. But it helps build energy, and I do a lot less. I used to run every day. I was a fanatical runner. I ran five miles every day. I entered races. I did all this stuff. I had surgery on both knees, wore my knees out, advanced the aging process, more gray hair, losing my hair, okay? So, so it's not, because I thought life was a marathon. No, life is engage intensely and then disengage. So when I'm finished with this lecture, I'm going to disengage mentally as well. I'm going to pull back and just let my mind think about something I love to think about and let my mind relax, okay? Because that's how you be successful. That's how these tennis players go from number 200 to number one. They, when they're serving the ball, they're totally focused, okay? When that ball hits the net by either party, they're trained at this institute to disengage. Just pull back, let your mind wander. Don't start evaluating why you, where you fail, what you did wrong. Just let yourself recover for 30 seconds until that next serve, and then re-engage. That's how you be successful. That's how you be successful in work, okay? Okay? Next one. The best way to think about one's business career is a marathon rather than a sprint. False. Life is a series of sprints in every area, you know. It, it, it's a good idea if you're physically exhausted and you don't have energy, don't engage in a conversation with your girlfriend or your boyfriend about something important because you're probably going to screw it up. You know, it's better to wait until you have the energy to do it because it takes energy. It's just, and it's the same energy you run a marathon with, you know. You ever notice when you come home and your roommate didn't clean the bathroom and you're, you had a rough day, a, 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 a financial accounting test and you're irritable and uh, you walk in the bathroom and it's a mess and you, you, what do you do? You blow up. Where if you, you know, if you, if, you, if you had energy and you were rested, you probably wouldn't do that. Okay? So, uh, and in all, uh, we got to, uh, we got to balance energy with recovery. So we got to go a little beyond what we're used to to build energy and then recover. Okay. So this is, this is the idea, that I, I stress myself a little bit, and then I recover. And then I'm going so, to begin to build my energy level. Okay? Do you know that shift workers live 10 to 12 years less than people who don't work shifts because they never get to recover? Okay, that's a statistic. Um, and uh, I had a time in my life where I was an accounting supervisor for Armstrong World Industries out in Southgate, California. And I walked out to my new job as an accounting supervisor. I had eight people reporting to me. I was only a year and a half with the company. And uh, the controller walked out the door, not because of me. She, she had a better opportunity. 
And it was Southern California, very expensive place to live. They couldn't get someone to come out there. So I'm like this new accountant trying to figure out where the bathroom is, and I'm in charge of everything. And there's an audit going on, and it's year-end closing. And so, you know, I said, you know, no problem. I'll just work seven days a week. Thank God I wasn't married. It would have ruined my marriage. And I was working seven days a week, 16 hours a day. I did nothing but eat and sleep and run in the morning on the beach in the San Pedro Bay and commute to work up the 7 freeway. And I did this for six months. And I thought, you know, I told my boss, he said, well, we'll hire some the big four to help. And I said, no, I'll do it. I'll, I'll do it, you know. And I, I, I was just exhausted. I was so inefficient because I was just burned out. And I, wasn't, I had no recovery, you know. And what happened was uh, eventually, the, and I thought I was being kind to my employees, but what I was real, I was saying, you know, hey, you got to get through this. We'll make it. You know, if you need any help, just let me know. But my eyes were saying, you know, you get moving and get this done. I'm working 16 hours a day. By God, you're going to do it too. You know, and that's what my eyes were saying. And one day the boss called me in, the head of the facility, and he said, Rod, he said, uh, I thought he was going to say, hey, great job. Thanks for plugging, man. Really appreciate it. He said, Rod, I've had every employee in here complaining that you're pushing them too hard. You know? And that was, a, that was an epiphany for me in my career where I said, you know, people are more important than processes. And, 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 but it was because I was exhausted. I had no, I had no energy and I wasn't recovering. Okay. So protecting yourself and others from high stress is an important part of your leadership. False. Stress is an opportunity from growth. Protection from stress erodes capacity. They know medically that if you retire and do nothing, your brain collapses. If you don't, if you don't do things with your brain, you lose the capacity in your brain. If you don't challenge your brain, you know, I don't like doing puzzles and playing games. My wife loves to do that. I'm starting to do that because I know it sharpens your mind. You know? uh, things that push us the most help us. No discomfort, no growth. Okay? And this is the kind of thing. If my current energy level is here at 26 years old and I want to increase my energy level to, to cover increasing demands, I've got to do something. I've got to push myself beyond physically and other places. And I've got to eat, exercise, sleep, and work strategically if I'm going to do that, okay? And, and, and this is what we learned at the... So let's talk about a few of these real quick, and we'll get you out of here in time. First of all, uh, nutrition, okay? Uh, you got to eat strategically if you want to manage energy because if I go out and, you know, eat the energy, drink the energy drinks and they bring me way up here, they're going to let me down way down here, okay? Or I drink too much coffee or whatever. And by the way, we always use the 80-20 rule. Everything I'm sharing with you, 80% of the time do this. 20% of the time do whatever, whatever the hell you want, you know, in terms of eating and stuff. You know, enjoy your screaming yellow zonkers and your uh, chocolate cake and all that. But, but you know, just, just, just do this part of the time at least. So eat light and often. You've heard that. Eat small amounts often, not big, huge amounts. I used to come home from work at night, and this is the place I still struggle is I unwind by eating. I get home from work sometimes at 8.30 at night, and I'm not hungry, and I go in the refrigerator, and I just start grazing. You know, I'm not hungry, but I'm eating. And what that does is that sends my glycemic index way up here, and then I'm, I don't sleep good during the night and all, and all that kind of stuff. And I'm not heavy because I also overexercise. So I was like a, turning the heater and the air conditioning up at the same time where I was out you know, overeating and then overexercising. So I wore my knees out, advanced the aging process, all that kind of stuff, okay? Um, and this, but, but eating often small amounts. And you want to stay within a glycemic index. So you want to mix certain foods. So if I eat uh, rice, which is high glycemic, meaning high sugar, I also eat some nuts or something with it because that balances the glycemic index. These guys that do the uh, sumo wrestlers, you know how they gain weight? They don't eat that much. What they do is they skip breakfast and lunch, and then they eat 10,000 calories for dinner, guaranteed to put huge amounts of weight on you and, re and, 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 and make you heavy. Okay? So you want to mix. Uh, and, and also, don't go more than three hours without eating. And this is new, new physiology information, too. So because what your body does is it goes into what's called survival mode when you don't eat for three hours. It says, Anna hasn't eaten for three hours, so she's in starvation mode. So I am going to, when Anna needs energy to take this test in the PA program, I'm going to start burning muscle tissue, not fat, because your body reserves fat for the very end when you're starving to death. Okay? So, so 
if you don't eat, you send the signal through your body to burn. It burns some fat, but it burns muscle tissue too. And you don't want to build, burn muscle tissue because muscle tissue burns calories at rest. So I carry around with me just a little trail mix thing. And I just never go more than three hours without taking a little bit of this just to tell my body that it's okay to burn fat, not calories when you need, when not, not muscle tissue when you need energy. Okay? This is all research stuff, you know, it's, and some of it's new, new type research. Okay? So, uh, so you want to eat often but small amounts. And that snack just needs to be 75 calories, not, not more. Okay? And then you do portion size. Okay? So um, let me see your hand for a second. You know, I, if you look at my hand, turn it, can you turn around like that? Yeah. And look at her hand. If you take this part of her hand, she's a little smaller than me, that should be about a portion size, okay? So just this part of your hand, not piled up that high, okay? And so uh, what you want to do is eat grains, and you can even eat less grains, and you can get more of your carbs from vegetables too, but vegetables and protein in, in sort of this order, okay? And uh, just, you know, two, two, two hand-sized things of, of grain or, or vegetables and maybe at least one of protein. You can eat more protein if you want. That's okay too. But that kind of gives you a guideline for your meals. Use the glycemic index. Eat low glycemic snacks. Okay, so these are, these are glycemic. So high glycemic things, as you might imagine, are candy, soda, pretzels, potatoes, go, potato chips. Go ahead and enjoy them, but r recognize that if you do eat them, you should eat some other things that are proteins or lower to balance that out so you don't shoot your glycemic index way up here and waste all that energy and then be way down here at the bottom. Are you following me? Do you think this is crazy? Hmm? It's interesting. Huh? So, you know, these are the things that are, you know, um, and, and so, so you don't want to, you want, you don't want to fall below here because that's when you're not going to do good in the test, good in the tennis game, have a good conversation with your girlfriend or boyfriend. You want to stay, try and keep your glycemic index in here. And again, 80, 20, you know, 80% of the time do this, 20% of the time go, go, go enjoy what you like to eat. But interestingly, when you eat things that are better for you, and you, you start to like them, you know, Li life and food is about not the sedation of appetite, it's about uh, our culture, it's cultural, you know, and because I was raised and my mama made pasta and I ate pasta and so that's what I'm going to be eating all the time, you know. So uh, here's what you want to do. You don't want to eat until you're in a food coma, you know, which I do sometimes at night. This is the part I really struggle with. You want to eat until you feel flu full. If you want to... If you want to lose some weight, feel feeling of hunger, stomach growls a little bit. If you want to lose, if you want to lo lose weight, feel satisfied but not hungry anymore. Don't eat. It takes about 20 minutes for your body to catch up with your with your mind there. Okay, and then to maintain weight. Okay, I'm going to do real quick on exercise. I mentioned because I want to get you guys out of here, but we can talk more about this. But you know, again, uh, you know, do. Do sleep strategically seven to eight hours. You guys who say, I only need four hours of sleep. No, that's not true. Physiologically, that's not true. You need to sleep, most people, seven to eight hours. Okay? And have a ritual before you go to bed. I read. If I read, I get tired, I fall asleep. You know, if I don't, I don't fall asleep that easy. If I wake up in the middle of the night, I read and fall asleep. You know? so, that's a, uh, so strategic, you know, these are sort of obvious things. Stand up instead of sitting down. I have a life desk at home. I have a view of the ocean. I stand up and work for 30 minutes, then I sit down. You burn five times the calories standing up than you do sitting down. Okay? So at work, we have this new way of working. We have desks that raise up. I stand up a good part of my day. Because when you sit on your butt, you constrict the blood flow, and it actually impairs your cognitive ability when you're sitting down for long periods of time. At work, I regularly never sit for more than 60 minutes. I get up, I take a walk, go take care of a memo or do something, get up and move around much better for your cognitive ability, okay? Avoid drive-through uh, beer stations and stuff. <laughs> yeah, so um, some exercise is better than none, plan movement, stretching. I'm gonna skip some of this, but uh, again, if you wanna grow, you gotta go above your comfort level to build your energy to a new level, okay? And it doesn't need to be a lot. I, like I said, I only exercise 30 minutes, three or four days a week. You can do 20 minutes if you do like CrossFit and some of that kind of stuff. Okay, and that's this is just the sets you should do, the body parts you should work. Okay, and then emotionally and mentally, again, you got to disengage. You can't be focused on that accounting test for four hours straight. You're not going to be effective. Study for for 30 to 60 minutes. 
disengage. Go think about something, you know, uh, sing a song, pray, you know, take a walk, watch a funny segment of a movie, whatever, whatever, whatever helps your mind relax, okay? Um, and then they talk about the spiritual part of it, and this is important, is that, and, and the spiritual part isn't religion, it's, it's mission. You all have a mission in life, okay? And, and if I ask all of you, what's your mission? What are you going to do? You want to accomplish your mission at all costs, okay? And if I ask you, what's your mission, Anna, you may say to me, I want to be a great, uh, you know, wife and mother. I want to be a great accountant. I want to do be the CFO of my company someday. I want to do all these things. But then our actions aren't consistent with our mission because if you want to do all these things, you need energy to do these things. And if you're too busy to eat right, you're too busy to exercise, you're too busy to spend time with your kids and your wife and your spouse and your boyfriend and your girlfriend, then you're, not, you're living inconsistent with your mission. So at all costs, you finish your mission. And I'll close with this story real quick. Is uh, they, In this training center, they, they have a film of this. They have these three football players, so you'd know their names. They're NFL stars. And they told them, here's your mission today. I want you to run... Uh, one mile in nine minutes down to this fence in Orlando, Florida, touch the fence and come back in nine minutes. Can you do that? And they said, you bet, man, we can do that. And they said, well, before you start, there's some alligators down here because there's water around, so just be careful that they are not sunbathing and sometimes water moccasins, but they're very rare. So are you going to finish your mission at all costs? They said, yes, sir, we're going to finish our mission. So they said, okay, on your mark, it said, oh, one other thing. Sometimes there's wild boars down here, but they're not very common. But, um, okay, you're going to finish your mission? Yep. They hit the gun. These guys took off. They had this on film. They get about three-quarters of the way to the white fence, and uh, they hear a wild boar, and they all stop, big-eyed and going, oh, my God. You know? and, and they hear it again, and they look at each other, and they turn around, and they run back to the instructor. And the instructor said, did you guys finish your mission? And they said, uh, no, ma'am, we saw a wild boar. They said, you saw a wild boar? And he said, yeah, yeah, it, it was loud. And uh, we didn't see it, but we heard it. You know? And so then they did the same thing with some Navy SEALs and some first responders. And they got down, they heard the wild boar, they stopped, and they moved toward the danger. And they went in the woods about, a hundred, about uh, 10 yards, and they saw an instructor with a wild boar claw up in a tree. They went down, they touched the fence, and they came back, and they finished their mission. So, you know, and, and, and that's what you got to do. If your mission is you want to be the CFO of the company, you want to be a good husband, a good father, whatever your mission is, you know, save the whales, you know, save the world, then you finish it at all costs. And in order to do that, you need energy, and you need to manage energy. So that, that's the spiritual part of this, is just to have a mission, and, and very important, write down your mission. Write down what you're going to accomplish. 